In an urban area of Belize City, where it once flourished, one small cluster of dense mangrove forests still remains. These have dominated these coastal areas for majority of our country's history. But development and urban sprawl have decreased their population. Mangroves are often seen as an eyesore, nothing but swampy land that harbors pests. But there is one urban area that still embraces the beauty of mangrove forests. This wetland ecosystem that sits on the SJC campus still provides a habitat for so many other organisms. Belize is a small tropical country that sits at the heart of Central America and the Caribbean. Its unique location makes for a diversity of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. A country that sits below sea level has a coastline that is bordered by clumps of mangrove forests and lagoons. As we move inland from the coast, the terrain changes from swamps to savannas and tropical hardwood forests. The islands support a cluster of littoral forests and lagoons. Mangroves cover about 3.5% of Belize's land, with majority existing on the eastern shores, estuaries, and many islands that freckle the territorial waters. There are three main types of mangroves, easily named by color. Red mangrove Rhizophora mango is perhaps the most iconic of the mangrove species. Easily identified by its prop roots that extend the tree out the water like giant spider legs. This is the most common of the mangrove species, named for the bright color red it produces under the bark. Its dark green leathery leaves, often yellow before falling off, expelling excess salts and returning nutrients to its surroundings. Black mangrove, Avicenna germinans, looks more like a tree than the spidery red. It can be distinguished by its thick trunk and dark bark. The leaves are green on the surface, but beneath have a silvery back. On the ground, spike strips of roots surround its perimeter. The white mangrove, Laguncularia racemosa, often grows as small shrubs further upland from the red and the black. The leaf has an oval shape with a dimpled apex. At the base of the leaf are two tit glands believed to release excess salts and sugars. Leaves are attached to a red petiole and the trunk of the tree often has large white scales. Buttonwood, Conocarpus erectus, sometimes referred to as the gray mangrove, is not really a mangrove. Its preliminary growth starts as a multi-truncated shrub and can survive in similar conditions as that of the white mangrove. This makes it useful for seaside landscaping and land reclamation. The name buttonwood is derived from the button-like flowers and fruits that farm at the tip of the branches. The Australian pine, Casuarina equisetifolia, is a mangrove associate. 
neither a true pine species nor a wetland species. This pine is capable of surviving in slightly saline soils, escaping competition. Its needle leaves are actually the stem of the plant, with microscopic scale leaves around. Commonly known as the whistling pine, it forms pink, wispy flowers when in bloom that eventually produce small, cone-like fruits. Various adaptations cause mangroves to distribute in a pattern that reduces competition. Starting from the sea, the red mangrove is the furthest out, followed by the black, and then the white, the buttonwood, and the Australian pine furthest up. Mangroves are the only tree species specially adapted to survive in coastal saline or brackish water. To escape competition, these trees have to be adapted to some of the most severe conditions with diurnal changes in abiotic factors. They must cope with the changes of the tides and the fluctuating salinity due to tidal pool formation, rains, and crashing wave action. These swampy environments are also a major part of the biogeochemical cycles. The black waterlogged soil might not be ideal for gardening, but it is rich in organic matter. The anaerobic bacteria beneath releases hydrogen sulfide as a byproduct of decomposition. When disturbed, a rotten egg odor rises from the mud. These soils also serve as an efficient carbon sink. Including carbon stored by the trees, mangroves store more carbon per hectare than terrestrial forests. So we're in the area of the campus behind the gymnasium. So we're a bit closer to the sea. So all the trees that occupy this area are dominantly red mangrove. And what I'm sitting on is actually one of the prop roots of the red mangrove. So as you can see, these roots are pretty strong. Now everything heading that way is towards the sea and because of the way the mangroves are zonated, you'll have most of the red mangrove because they're the most adapted to survive in deeper water um, they can adapt to different or higher salinity levels um, the fluctuations of the tide don't affect the tree as much because it has these crop roots that keep it out of the water so that the tree can still breed the roots remember they need to breed and also exchange oxygen now it's a dense network of red mangrove roots extending all the way to the sea and what that also does it forms a buffer for the coastal ecosystem. Because it's like a net, it reduces the amount of erosion that occurs in the areas where mangroves grow. And also it filters upland pollution and runoff. So anything that's coming from the city side, flushing out to sea, the mangroves work as a trap to sort of stop all garbage and also filter out any um, pollutants, liquid pollutants or diluted pollutants that be, might be within the um, water runoff. Mangroves also use up a lot of nutrients. So instead of polluting the sea with high amounts of nitrate, the mangroves actually consume high amounts of nitrates before those extend into the sea and cause other issues like eutrophication. Now what these also serve as are a protection from waves. So while it filters upland towards the sea, it blocks a lot of wave action. 
especially from storm surges and hurricanes. So the high winds from hurricanes, majority of that damage is done to the mangroves before it reaches the land. And also the waves that come crashing in, the mangroves help to break down some of those heavy waves. The system also houses a lot of water. So when it rains, majority of that water accumulates in this marsh or wetland ecosystem that the mangroves create. Mangroves are an important lifeline for several other coastal and marine ecosystems. On the mainland, marshes and lagoons are supported by the incoming tides. They also act as a reservoir for large volumes of rain and flood water. the sea closest to the mangroves, seagrass communities benefit from reduced floating sediments and increased nutrients. Together, mangroves and seagrass reduce a lot of coastal erosion and improve water quality. And perhaps the most important ecosystem that benefits from the mangroves are our coral reefs. clearer waters makes Belize home to the largest living barrier reef. Many of the fish and other organisms that live on the reef spend their juvenile years within the mangroves or seagrass communities. The roots of the mangrove provide an important sanctuary for juvenile fish and crustaceans. When these animals grow into adults, they then venture out and often live on the reef. The reef is an important economic earner due to fisheries and tourism. The prop roots of the red mangrove can extend the tree as much as six feet above the ground. The red mangrove grows in the deepest waters. These roots are important to keep the plant above the high tide mark. They use these roots to breed, as small holes on the roots known as lenticels are used to trade oxygen. From these lenticels, the plant also expels excess salts. Like snorkels sticking out the water, the black mangrove has peg roots known as pneumatophores to help it breed. These specialized aerial roots allow the plant to utilize air not necessarily available in the waterlogged soils. Similar to that of the black, the white mangrove has a stunted new metaphor. trees might not be subjected to tidal flooding as much as the red or the black, they don't have to be as long. So another structure unique to mangroves are aerial roots. So what you see behind me here are some aerial roots of the red mangrove. Now what these roots do, from the branches at the top of the tree, they start sending down these roots that eventually start splitting into groups of either two, three, or four. So each root eventually splits, splits, until it forms that network that you see extending from the top of the tree to the soil. So at the tip of that root is a black, a little black tip that it used to sense when it touches the soil and then it'll start making extra roots for support for the tree and also if you look along the root itself closely there are a lot of small bumps these are called lenticels these are extra breeding roots for the mangrove that it uses to expel excess salt and also for the tree to breed remember it still needs to treat oxygen and carbon dioxide so it allows that to happen through some of those lenticels
Here we have a very large black mangrove tree. And some of the aerial roots that the black produces. Now it doesn't extend as far as that of the red. But those also help this tree to breed. Another unique quality of mangroves is that it produces vaporous seeds. These seeds begin the germination process while still attached to the parent plant. The red mangrove produces a pencil-like propagule that can detach itself from the tree and stake itself into the ground. So that pencil seed or propagule that we had from the red mangrove Remember I said how it sticks itself into the ground and it starts to grow? So we have an example right here of some propagules that got stuck into the ground and started to regrow some new red mangroves. So eventually these will start forming the branching prop roots that we're used to. So here are some examples of some. So again, this heavier end, you see the roots starting to come out from this one it was hanging from the tree those drops sticking to the ground and a new red mangrove plant can be grown from this seed all mangrove propagules float and are assisted by water for dispersal mangroves have seeds which actually germinate on the parent plant before floating off to root in new land. Buttonwood has seeds that are ripened on the plant before it bursts and is dispersed. They later germinate in areas they settle like normal plants. Deforestation remains a major threat to this ecosystem with less than 50% of the world's original mangrove cover remaining. Mangroves are harvested mainly for fuel wood and charcoal. The majority of the destruction is due to coastal development for creation of beaches and residential areas. Also, aquaculture, namely shrimp farming, has taken a toll on the mangrove ecosystem. Hurricanes still remain a natural cause for destruction of mangroves. Due to increased awareness of the importance of mangroves, the government is now encouraging development on higher land away from the mangroves. Since 1989, all mangroves in Belize are protected
NGOs and local participants have had much success in reforesting mangrove communities. As these pioneer species colonize the coast, a lot of other organisms can now benefit and thrive in these areas. The swamps and lagoons, which are viewed as wastelands, are actually rich with life and nutrients. Mangroves are a habitat and food source for juvenile fish, crustaceans such as crabs, shrimp and lobster, and snails. Waders, shorebirds, and raptors all find abundant food sources within the mangrove swamps and marshes. As one of the largest feeding grounds inside city limits, this college campus is an ideal pit stop for over 100 species of identified birds. This entire ecosystem only survives because of the last urban mangrove forest. If you are interested in birding, download the eBird and Merlin bird apps from your app store. The easy to use app provides quick bird ID along with useful information and bird calls.